Good morning. So we are continuing with our study here in the Gospel of Luke. And we've seen some actually very interesting scenarios here. Zacchaeus, which is one that I always love, climbing the tree, wanting to see, you know, who's coming down the road and who is this Jesus? And, and, and Jesus walks right under the branch he's hanging on and then stops and looks up and says, Zacchaeus, come on down. I'm going to your house tonight. He knew hearts, and he still knows hearts, Jesus, that is. And I wonder, you know, as we see so many hardships in this life, in this world, um, our hearts tend to harden. Circumstances in our lives, offenses people bring against us, betrayals, um, trials of all kinds, illnesses. You always have a choice. You can either harden your heart or keep it soft. Now, I will admit, and I'll be the first one to admit to you that, you know, to keep your heart open is to also invite pain. But let me ask you, what are the times that you actually grow more in your life, spiritually, etc.? In times of easiness and softness or times of of trial and pain. So we're seeing here the Lord who often is able to discern hearts. He does it with the Pharisees and the scribes. He knew their hearts were hard. If you go all the way in the Old Testament, you know that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And when Moses went to speak to Pharaoh, he wasn't getting through because Pharaoh had hardened his heart. Everything in this life is going to impinge on whether your heart is hard or soft. And we, we harden our hearts for various reasons. Sometimes we do it to protect ourselves. Uh, well, actually, a lot of times we do it to protect ourselves. Uh, sometimes we do it <clears throat> just out of anger and, and being upset with other people. We just allow it to get rigid and hard. And you know, sometimes we wonder, Lord... Will my heart ever be soft again? Will I ever be able to feel as I once did? I hope, beloved, that you're not in that place today. Nevertheless, having an open heart means you have a malleable heart. And a malleable heart the Lord can work with. And he's willing to <clears throat> and desires to. So we, we see Zacchaeus and that whole story of him and how he really did have a malleable, soft heart. <clears throat> Even though he was judged by everybody, the fact that a matter is Zacchaeus was trying to honor God in a very hard job. And then we saw the triumphal entry where our Lord comes into Jerusalem and then he weeps when he comes into Jerusalem. And he weeps showing his compassion for his people. For you and for me, for all of his people, Israel. And <clears throat> so we go through here and we come to verse 45. And it says here, then he went into the temple and he began to drive out those who bought and sold in it. Saying to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer and you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests, the scribes, the leaders of the people sought to destroy him. Hard hearts for sure, right? <clears throat> and they were unable to do anything for all the people were very attentive to hear him. So the people stood against him. You had hard hearts. You had, you know, these individuals who made a lot of money selling the things that they sold in the temple. And people come in, they bought all sorts of trinkets and other things. They bought sacrifice pigeons and all of these things were there for sale and it was making a profit. Jesus came in and drove them all out and then rebukes them and says, you know, it is written, my house is a house of prayer and you've made it a den of thieves. So he rebukes all of those whose businesses this really was. Of course they sought to kill him. They didn't want to keep him there. He just exposed everything about them. 
The only reason they couldn't kill him was because the majority of people loved him and, and were following him and saw nothing wrong with him. So this scene surely shows us hard hearts, hearts set against truth, hearts set against what is right and just, instead making money off of thievery, as Jesus said, a den of thieves, he called it. Truth means something. We have a phrase that says, truth hurts. You bet it does. It also exposes. <clears throat> it exposes the things in this life that are wrong, that God will judge, that we need to look toward. We need to look toward exposing. Let's look at verse uh, chapter 20 here. Now it happened on one of those days as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel, that the chief priests, the scribes, together with the elders, confronted him. And spoke to him, saying, Tell us by what authority are you doing these things? Or, Who is he who gives you this authority? <clears throat> but he answered and he said to them, I also will ask you one thing and answer me. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Well, they reasoned among themselves, saying, Well, if we say from heaven, he's going to say, well, then why did you not believe him? But if we say from men, all the people are going to stone us because they are persuaded John was a prophet. So they answered and they said they did not, they answered they did not know where it was from. And Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. It was a brilliant response. He caught them, right, in a trap, <clears throat> their trap that they were trying to spring on him. The one thing I notice very often in the Gospels is when Jesus is confronted with a trap question, he often answers with a question. <clears throat> he turns it around onto them. <clears throat> I'm not sure you've noticed this, but when he's confronted with a trap question, he often turns it around on them. Which is very interesting. Well, here, they couldn't say that John's baptism was from heaven because everybody would say, why did you get baptized? And they didn't want to say it wasn't because the people believed it was and they would stone them to death. So they feigned ignorance. They feigned ignorance. <clears throat> well, now he's going and he's talking a bit about a parable of the wicked vine dressers. Then he began to tell the people this parable. A certain man went out and planted a vineyard, leased it to vine dressers, and went into a far country for a long time. Now, at vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that they might give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the vine dressers beat him and sent him away empty handed. Again, he sent another servant, and they beat him also, and treated him shamefully, and sent him away empty-handed. And again, he sent a third, and they wounded him also, and cast him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I'll send my beloved son. Probably they will respect him when they see him. But when the vine dressers saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him that the inheritance may be ours. <clears throat> so they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, certainly not. Then he looked at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Whoever falls on that stone will be broken, but on whoever it falls, it will grind him to powder. <clears throat> and the chief priests and the scribes that very hour sought to lay hands on him, but they feared the people, for they knew he had spoken this parable against them. I mean, once again... 
he gives a very clear parable that God has sent in the vineyard of Israel. God has sent prophet after prophet and the children of Israel have killed him, killed them. Finally, he sends his son and they take him out of the vineyard outside of the area there in the hill, Golgotha, right? And they kill him. Now, what's the vine dresser going to do? <clears throat> Jesus says this, he's going to, He's going to come and judge them. And what do they say? He will come and destroy those vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. And they had the hubris to say, certainly not. He's not going to give the, the vine. The, he's not going to give the vineyard to others. It belongs to us. And Jesus quotes a passage here. From the Old Testament and he says what then is this that is written the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone whoever falls on that stone be broken and on whomever it falls it will grind him to powder now the priests knew the chief priests the scribes the Pharisees they all knew that this parable was spoken was being spoken about them Boy, first in the temple, then, you know, taking away their money, calling them a den of thieves. Now, Israel and everything about Israel is going to be taken away from them and given to others. And they say, certainly not. What do they end up doing? Verse 19, the chief priests and the scribes, that very hour, sought to lay hands on him. But they feared the people, for they knew he had spoken this parable against them. Everywhere they go, every time they're involved in a confrontation with the Lord or a conversation with him, he exposes their evil. They're plotting their hearts. And you know, that's what God is good at. That's what God does. He, he exposes our hearts exposes our hearts to others but most of all to ourselves so that we have an opportunity to turn our hearts back toward him I don't know if he's done that to you recently or if he's done it even yet but I would guess my next question is would you be willing would you be willing to allow your heart to turn toward him? Well, now he, he's confronted another time by the Pharisees, right? Let's look at verse 20. So they watched him. Remember, they were plotting to kill him. They wanted to get rid of him. Boy, are they mad at him. We're told, so they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be righteous that they might seize on his words in order to deliver him to the power and the authority of the governor. They want to bring spies to seize on his words, to turn him in, <clears throat> put him in jail. You know, They want to deliver him to the power and authority of the governor because they couldn't really condemn him themselves and they didn't want to because the people would get upset. If the governor, the government, or the state condemned him, that was good enough for them. Most people won't question the governor or the state or things like that. They just go with it. Verse 21, and when they asked him saying, teacher, we know that you say and teach rightly. You do not show personal favoritism, but you teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Well, they're buttering him up, buttering him up here, weren't they? Um, oh, good teacher. We know that you teach rightly, that you're A number one. You're the best, you know. You don't show personal favoritism. You teach the truth of the way of God. They're really buttering him up. But here's the hammer. 
is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But we're told this in verse 23, but he perceived their craftiness in their hearts and said to them, why do you test me? Show me a denarius. And they pulled it out. Whose image and inscription does it have? And they said, Caesar's. And he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they could not catch him in his words in the presence of the people. They marveled at his answer and kept silent. I love that particular parable because they tried to capture him and he once again, knowing their thoughts and their hearts, turned it around against them. I can remember when I went to, started off in a seminary some years ago, one of my teachers, a Dr. Charles Ryrie, um, I guess the editor of the Ryrie Study Bible, he spoke to the incoming freshman class, of which I was one. And I remember him saying that day we were sitting there in the auditorium the first day at school. And he said, I want you to look to the person to the left of you. <clears throat> and everybody sitting there turned and looked to the person left of us. He said, that person's not going to be here in the end of four years. Everybody was shocked. They're not going to be here. They're going to be gone. They're going to give up, quit, put school aside. They're just not going to finish. Rather scary terms, right? <clears throat> so I remember sitting there vowing to myself, I'm not going to be one of those individuals. I was a little older, already had a small daughter, very small, one and a half. Married man. I wasn't quitting. And I remember when Dr. Charles Ryrie came up to the podium and he looked out across the auditorium and he said <clears throat> this parable. They, they asked him who to pay taxes to. Is it lawful to pay him to Caesar? And Jesus said, give me a denarius. Whose image is on the coin? Caesar's. And render unto Caesar with Caesar's. But God with his gods. And then he took his glasses off and he looked at us and he said, Ladies and gentlemen, whose image is in you? And we responded, God's. And he said, and he gave you a brain. Render unto God that which is God's. I remember that statement. It filled me with a powerful enthusiasm. And I kept going. I got my bachelor's and my master's and my doctorate and just kept going. Rendering unto God that which is God's. The same goes for you and for me. God has given us a brain. We are to utilize it for his glory and to do just that, right? So it's interesting as Jesus was being set up time and time again, and yet they still could not really get him. But I will say this, when they brought this up and Jesus gave him his statement, render to Caesar things that are Caesar and to God things that are God's, it says, but they could not catch him in his words in the presence of the people. And they marveled at his answer and kept silent. Then some of the Sadducees who deny there's a resurrection came. They came to him asking him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife, and he does without and he dies without children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died without children. Well, the second took her as a wife, and he died childless. The third took her, and in like manner, the seven also. And they left no children, and all died. 
Well, first of all, I'd say, what's up with that woman? I'm <laughs> just kidding. Seven guys married her and they all die. There's something fishy going on. In their analogy here, they say this. Last of all, verse 32, the woman dies. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife does she become? For all seven had her as wife. Interesting. Well, Jesus answering says to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage here in this world. But those who are counted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die anymore, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. They're living in resurrected bodies, so they're not going to die again. They don't need to be married. But even Moses showed in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised when he called the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. For he's not the God of the dead, but of the living, and all live to him. And some of the scribes answered and said, Teacher, you've spoken well. But after that, they dared not question him anymore. You know, now he's talking eternal things and he does a really good job with it. In the resurrection, there is no marriage because we're eternal now. We don't need to have a marriage state. There'd be a lot of wedding anniversaries, wouldn't it? <clears throat> and yet, as he, as he sits here speaking about all of this, the, Pharise the Sadducees, remember, did not believe in a resurrection. Which is why he kind of hones in on it. And he says, but even Moses showed in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised. When he called the Lord the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, the only way he could have been the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob at that present time is if they were still alive. So when we die on this earth, we, we pass from here, but we're not dead eternally. Does that make sense? We're not snuffed out and gone. We're living, just living in a different realm. And that's why he says, for he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. For all live to him. Well, some of the scribes were actually quite moved by this and they said, teacher, you've spoken well. But one thing is for sure, they weren't trying to trap him anymore. Because he gave some pretty powerful explanations to what they were saying. And he said to them, how can they say that the Christ is the son of David? Now David himself said in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand and I will make your enemies your footstool." Therefore, David calls him Lord. How is he then his son? Well, that's a good question. Then in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, Beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes. They love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at feasts who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, these will receive greater condemnation. Well, because they're teachers of the law. They're not, you know, they've become so vain and ungodly. Everything's a show. Of course they love seats in the marketplaces and the feasts, the best seats in the house, the all, you know, long flowing robes. They like to look good. But Jesus says this is not working anything good for them, right? Ultimately, he said these will receive a greater condemnation because they've been given the task to teach Israel the law, the, the lawyers, the scribes. They're not to abuse it themselves. That's what you're seeing happen. Now, chapter 21, we get into a little bit here called the widow's two mites. And he looked up and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he also saw a certain poor woman, a poor widow, putting in two mites. 
So he said, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all. For all these out of their abundance have put things in for God, but she out of her poverty. But in all the, li but in all the livelihood that she said. So, that she had. Again, he sees her heart. He knows that that's all she has, and yet she gives it away. Whereas the rich man is giving in his money, but he does this weekly, and he prides himself on how much he gives and writes that check out for the church and, you know, all of that. Verse 5, then some spoke of the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and do donations. And he said, these things which you see, the days will come in which not one stone shall be left upon another, that not want, no, that they shall not be thrown down. So they asked him, saying, teacher, but with all these things, how will these all these things be? And what sign will be, will there be when these things are about to take place? And he says, Take heed that you be not deceived. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he. The time has drawn near. Therefore, do not go after them. But when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified. For these things must come to pass first. By the end, But the end will not come immediately. And then he said, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be great earthquake in various places and famines and pestilences. And there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. But before all these things, they will lay your hands. They will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and the prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. But it will not turn out for you as an occasion for your testimony. Therefore, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you're going to say. For I will give you a mouth and the wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to, to contradict or resist. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair of your head shall be lost. By your patience possess ye your souls. This is a big section here. Once again, we're dealing with, in, in theology, what we call eschatology, the last times. Um, you know, he gives signs for the last times. And, and as I've said before, we've seen these signs all over history. But I don't believe the book of Revelation is like fully literal and goes like that. I believe it goes like this. It goes in a straight direction, but it goes in a circular way, history. There's a lot of ways of looking at these passages, but, you know, the signs of the times is huge and so we're gonna we're gonna kind of end it here and i'm gonna read that passage again next time we'll begin at verse 7 of chapter 21 and we'll work our way down to 19 next time and we're gonna take a look because so many of these things happen quicker and in more progression when that happens that's i think what he means when he says i'm i'm at the door i'm coming and so we have to be patient. And he ends it here, you know, talking about the patience of the saints. And beloved, we're going to have to exercise that patience, especially till tomorrow. So let's pray. Father, thank you for settling our hearts and speaking to us through your word. We lift up to you all those here are sick and suffering. We pray that you would put a hedge of protection about them and keep them. And Lord, we pray also that you would give us courage and determination as we move forward. Trusting in your goodness, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. All right, I will see you tomorrow. Read ahead, finish the chapter, and we will get into it tomorrow. God love you.